We've no doubt about it that the Vietnam War was one of the leading factors in why the Great Society did not last beyond 1966. Uh, throughout his presidency, Lyndon Johnson claimed that the United States could afford both guns and butter, meaning that the guns part of it, the Vietnam War, the United States could continue to fight communists in Southeast Asia. And on the butter side, the United States could also afford, Lyndon Johnson claimed, to provide these social welfare safety nets for the majority of Americans. But increasingly after 1966, as more Americans and US politicians looked at the Vietnam War, they began to question this. And as a result, we see less of an emphasis on the Great Society, and more attention and money being given to fighting this war in Vietnam. But I also want to point to another aspect of the Vietnam War, and this will connect it to something that we talked about earlier in the second third of the course, and that is the Vietnam War as part of this policy of U.S. containment that we've been talking about going all the way back to 1946 when George Kennan proposed the idea in that document that we read earlier in the semester that the United States should seek to contain the spread of communism. Well, a lot of U.S. officials and foreign policy experts argued that the United States needed to intervene in Vietnam to do just that, to contain the communist menace. So therefore, we see this idea of the Vietnam War being a part and parcel with earlier examples of containment, whether we're talking about Greece and Turkey with the German doctrine, or they're talking about the Korean War in 1950. The Vietnam War is definitely a part of all of this idea of containment. I want to start by talking about the origins of American involvement, because really, we pick up the story late in the narrative. You can go all the way back to the 19th century, and what you're going to see is Indochina. And when we're talking about Indochina, we're talking about Vietnam, but we're also talking about Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. And what, excuse me, Cambodia and Laos as other parts of Indochina. And what we see is this territory is controlled by the French for much of the 19th century and into the 20th century as well, except for a minor hiccup, if you will, during World War II when Vietnam was controlled by the Japanese. But we're going to pick up the story here in 1954, the start, or excuse me, in 1946, the start of the first Indochina War, which will, in fact, run until 1954. And what this war did, this first Indochina War did, was it pitted the French against Vietnamese nationalists who were seeking independence. And these Vietnamese nationalists were led by an individual by the name of Ho Chi Minh. But nonetheless, we would see the United States paying close attention to what is going on in this far corner of the world in Southeast Asia. And in fact, by 1954, towards the end of this first Indochina War, the United States will fund 80% of the French military efforts in Vietnam. So you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why did the United States spend this much treasure to keep the French troops in Vietnam? Well, it goes back to that idea that I, when I was introducing this lecture, this idea of containment. And Eisenhower, President Dwight Eisenhower, who was the president here in the 1950s, he has a new wrinkle, a new label to this idea of containment with this domino theory. And you can see the quote on the screen, the domino theory as described by Eisenhower involved the following. You have a row of dominoes set up, you knock over the first one, and what will happen to the last one is a certainty that it will go over very quickly. So you could have a beginning of a disintegration that would have the most profound consequences. Clearly, what Eisenhower is talking about here is this idea of containment. The United States needs to stop the spread of communism, otherwise Vietnam will fall, followed by Thailand, followed by Japan, followed by Australia, until these communists are at America's doorstep. So this is the idea, again, direct correlation between the domino theory here in the 1950s and containment policy begun in 1946. But here's the thing, even with US financial support, the French were defeated in 1954 and left Vietnam following the battle at Dien Bien Phu. Well, here's the thing, 
Ho Chi Minh and his Vietnamese nationalists believed that this finally, here in 1954, after the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu, this finally represented Vietnamese independence. The Vietnamese had finally gotten what they had fought for for so long. But as it turned out, Ho Chi Minh's communist allies in the Soviet Union and China would pressure him into accepting in 1954 the Geneva Accords. Now the Geneva Accords did two things. First of all, they split Vietnam, Vietnam in, in half at the 17th parallel. And what you're going to have is north of the 17th parallel, you're going to have North Vietnam led by Ho Chi Minh and his communist forces. South of the 17th parallel, you're going to have South Vietnam that is led by, and you can do this thing, put in your quote marks again, a democratic, non-communist government, anti-communist government, led by an individual by the name of Ngo Dinh Diem. And here's the second part of the Geneva Accords, because it relates directly to this split. The promise was in 1954 that two years later, in 1956, there would be national elections to reunify the nation. Well, as it turned out, the United States was looking at what was going on in Vietnam here in 1956, and they would find that Ho Chi Minh had tremendous support across North and South Vietnam. And conversely, ZM, who was ruthless and totalitarian in how he treated various forces in South Vietnam, he was very unpopular. So therefore, if an election were in fact held in 1956, the United States realized that their bat, the, the man that they backed, ZM, would lose. So therefore, the United States denied that elections would take place in 1956. The United States would continue to support the ZM government in South Vietnam throughout the rest of the 1950s and into the early 1960s. However, the 1960s is more significant because of the growing Americanization of the war. What we begin to see, particularly in 1965 and after, is that the United States begins making Vietnam its war. So whereas before it more was acting in an advisory role throughout much of the 1950s and into the early 1960s, we would see this begin to grow first in an advisory role, but more so in a military role, particularly again after 1965. And we see this in terms of troop numbers and troop levels that you can see on the screen for this PowerPoint slide. So in late 1963, there were 17,000 advisors in Vietnam. And I wanna highlight that term advisors because that is a key aspect of how America tried to essentially hide its role in Vietnam during this period, 1963, 1964, and before. Because what these advisors were at least publicly supposed to be doing in Vietnam was training South Vietnamese troops to fight the war, providing them with military strategy, providing them with the know-how of how to use certain weapons, particularly American weapons that were being sent over to Vietnam. But nonetheless, there were 17,000 of these advisors in late 1963. And what we find is as we look through some of the documents during this time from the Kennedy administration and later the Johnson administration, these advisors were officially not supposed to be taking part in the actual fighting on the ground but nonetheless, sometimes they did. So keep in mind when we see this advisor's term, yes, they were non-military, but that's sort of uh, a, a hazy concept here with these advisors. But nonetheless, in late 63, 17,000 advisors, this number would grow. One year later, late 1964, 23,000 advisors. Now here's the important question to consider as well. So late 1963, this was right after John F. Kennedy was assassinated in November of 1963. So now the question became, what would Lyndon Johnson, his successor, do? Well, as we see here, he apparently, according to these numbers, will up the ante dramatically. And again, the key year in discussing this Americanization of the war is 1965 because we see two things happen in that year of 1965. First of all, the numbers jump dramatically up to 184,000. 
But secondly, and even more important, is who these 184,000 people are. And that is the fact that they are now military personnel. And we'll talk about this later in lecture, of course, but this is a key year for those two reasons, both in terms of numbers and in terms of what type of people are being sent over to Vietnam and what role they play. By 1966, just one year later, you'd have 450,000 military personnel. And then finally, by early 1968, and as we'll see later in lecture, 68 is another key year here. But nonetheless, by early 1968, you will have more than a half a million military personnel in Vietnam. Not surprisingly, as you have more and more American personnel in Vietnam, you would see the casualties rise during this time as well. And when we're talking about casualties, I've used this term in the past, it means the number of Americans killed, wounded, hospitalized, or missing. This number of casualties in 1965 was 2,500. By 1968, that number would rise to 130,000. Now this is key because as more and more body bags are being sent home from Vietnam, more and more Americans are paying attention to what takes place over there. So therefore, this is a key indicator as the casualty rate goes up, more attention from the American public and US officials as well. But here's the thing, these numbers that we've been talking about are so shocking when you go back and look at this period, 1963 and 1964, of the kind of reluctance and ambivalence of US officials when it came to talking about what the role should be for the United States in Vietnam. So for instance, to discuss, I wanna first discuss a fact-finding mission that was carried out by the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, in late 1963, in December of 1963. He would visit Saigon. Saigon was, of course, the, uh, the capital of South Vietnam. It's where the United States had its embassy. So this was a main central place in South Vietnam. And what Robert McNamara found during this fact-finding mission in late 1963 was that the Viet Cong, the Viet Cong was a communist military and polit political organization based in South Vietnam that actually opposed the United States and the South Vietnamese government. Well, this Viet Cong controlled more territory than ever here in late 1963, which McNamara described as very disturbing. Well, not long after that, the Central Intelligence Agency Director John McCone, the CIA Director John McCone, would also look into events in Vietnam and he would find the following, that there was, in his words, no organized government in South Vietnam. So what we see during this time is U.S. officials, top level U.S. officials, basically saying Vietnam is broken. And Lyndon Johnson, in May of 1964, will have conversations with some of his top people, including the man that we see on the right, his national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, where he is basically saying, why should the United States go into Vietnam? What purpose does it serve in the overall aims and goals of the United States? But nonetheless, as we see by these numbers on the screen, the United States puts more than a half a million men in Vietnam by 1968. Why? Very simply, it goes back to that idea of containment. It goes back to that idea with the domino theory, the fear that the United States, if it does nothing, will eventually be that last domino as communism takes over the world. Well, Lyndon Johnson questioned the need for America to play a larger role in Vietnam. His administration carried out planning for American involvement and refused to negotiate with the North Vietnamese. For instance, several plans were developed in early 1964 to bomb North Vietnam, though Lyndon Johnson feared an international outcry if he carried out these bombings, so he never put them into action, at least yet. He'll have to wait until after the election for that. But additionally, American officials also ignored French President Charles de Gaulle's various efforts to organize a peace conference on Vietnam. Now, this is interesting here because remember, it was the French who realized they were in the same boat as the United States. They believed that they could defeat the weak nationalists in Vietnam. Well, they found out otherwise, and President Charles de Gaulle was trying to therefore prevent the United States from making similar errors. 
Well, most of these events, whether it was planning for bombing, whether it was rejecting French President Charles de Gaulle's peace efforts, most of these events took place behind the scenes. While in the public, Lyndon Johnson portrayed himself as a peace candidate, especially as the 1964 election came closer and closer. So here's the thing. Even as he was running as a peace candidate in 1964, Lyndon Johnson also had to prove that he was not soft, if you will, on communism. Well, events in August of 1964 gave Lyndon Johnson an opportunity to prove that his toughness was real and that he could take on the communists. So what was this event that took place in August of 1964? These events, as we can see in the map on the right, took place in the Gulf of Tonkin, off the eastern coast of Vietnam. And what happened was this. This was a direct response, really, if you were, to a plan that Lyndon Johnson approved in early 1964. The plan was known as Op Plan 34A. And this Op Plan 34A involved having South Vietnamese ships supported by the US Navy conduct surveillance raids off the coast of North Vietnam. Well, in response to these continued raids, these surveillance raids, an event took place, even though the event itself is questionable in terms of whether it actually happened to the degree that U.S. officials later claimed it did. So nonetheless, we're going to begin this story on August 2nd of 1964. On August 2nd, Washington received reports of an attack on Navy ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. Well, two days later, on the night of August 4, the C. Turner Joy and the USS Maddox were attacked by torpedoes and PT boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. Interestingly enough, the captain of the USS Maddox later claimed in the, that that night attributed the supposed attacks to the poor weather rather than an actual attack. So in short, even the commander of the USS Maddox argued that the weather was likely playing tricks on the radar of the USS Maddox, so he could not guarantee that an actual attack took place. Lyndon Johnson also questioned whether an attack actually occurred. He said the following to an aide, hell, those dumb stupid sailors were just shooting at flying fish. But nonetheless, Lyndon Johnson realized that he could use this supposed altercation in the Gulf of Tonkin to his benefit. So therefore, under the pretense of an unprovoked attack, Lyndon Johnson saw congressional authorization for the United States to respond. The House voted 416 to 0, and the Senate voted 88 to 2 in support of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which, as you can see on the screen, gave the President of the United States the authority to use, quote, all necessary measure, measure, measures to do what? to repel any armed attacks against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression in the area. The document for this week, you will see that there was a, some debate. It didn't last long, but there was nonetheless some debate. And the fear was that this would give the president a blank check to carry out an expanded war in Southeast Asia. Well, in response to these concerns, Lyndon Johnson would actually promise that if he sent troops in the future, he would go back to Congress to seek approval. Well, in reality, he would not do so, and this would be another instance where a U.S. president during the Cold War would go to war without asking for approval from Congress, which is dictated in the Constitution that should be done. Within a month of his landslide victory over Barry Goldwater in 1964, Lyndon Johnson could finally begin to put into play the plans that he and his administration had put out regarding bombing campaigns in Vietnam. These bombings would begin after an attack at American base at Plea Q in South Vietnam on February 6, 1965. Now again, there would be several of these attacks throughout the early 1960s, but never before had Lyndon Johnson or John F. Kennedy used these attacks on U.S. bases to carry out an operation at the scale that Lyndon Johnson would hear. In the following month, in fact, he would carry out this campaign known as Operation Rolling Thunder. And just to show you the scale of this attack, from 1965 until the end of 1967, so about one and a half 
years, more than one and a half years really, the U.S. would drop more bombs, one and a half million tons, on Vietnam than it had in all of World War II. So right there you can see how much American air power is playing a war, uh, playing a part in this war. But here's the other thing, it wasn't just from the air that this war was escalating, it was also on the ground. In March 2 of that year as well, the base at Da Nang was attacked, and therefore this would lead to the introduction of U.S. combat troops in Vietnam for the first time in the course of this war. And as a result of this, this will be the culminating point when we will begin to see the Americanization of this war here in 1965. But this was still a small contingent of troops. Uh, and there's still the, the threat, obviously, in the future of this number growing to nearly half a million. So how did that happen? Well, it happened because we see here this so-called de de uh, decision time, as I call it, in the summer of 1965. And decision time begins in June of 1965 because General William Westmoreland, the individual that we see on the right side of the screen, requests an additional 93,000 ground troops. And this set up a debate in the White House. On the one side of this debate, among many, you're going to have Under Secretary of State George Ball, and he will oppose escalation. On the other side, you will have Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who supported escalation. Now, you're going to see these two different sides on the documents that you're reading for this week. But to get to the end of the story, Lyndon Johnson would agree, obviously, as we already know, based on the numbers that we saw of U.S. troops in Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson would agree with Robert McNamara. So therefore, immediately, Lyndon Johnson would authorize 44 U.S. battalions and send 50,000 additional soldiers immediately with more to follow in the coming months. So clearly, right away, we see this becoming more and more Johnson's war here in middle of 1965. In late 1967, General William Westmoreland, who was the top U.S. military official in Vietnam, would return home. And he would return home because there were growing doubts about America's involvement in Vietnam. Could the United States win this war? A lot of people are asking. So therefore, Lyndon Johnson here in late 1967 would bring back William Westmoreland to the United States and he would carry out this barnstorming tour and give a lot of interviews and a lot of speeches to the public and to the U.S. media. Well, during these talks with the public and the media, he would talk about the victory, American victory, being right around the corner. And it's not certain if he actually ever used this phrase, but it comes about to be associated with Westmoreland here in 67, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Well, as it turned out, that light at the end of the tunnel would not be the end of the war in Vietnam, but rather a train hurling towards the United States, really turning this war around in favor of the North Vietnamese. Because what will happen is in early 1968, during the ceasefire for the Lunar New Year, 84,000 North Vietnamese and their Viet Cong forces in the South attacked 36 cities during what became known as the Tet Offensive. And we can see the map here on the right, all of these cities across South Vietnam attacked by these North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops. And interestingly enough, one of the cities that they took over was Saigon. Saigon, as we talked about in the past in passing, was the capital of South Vietnam. And you would also have the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. And in fact, during this Tet Offensive, the U.S. Embassy in Saigon would be breached and it would be taken over momentarily by the North Vietnamese. In fact, what we will see is it took about 11,000 South Vietnamese and U.S. troops to oust 1,000 invaders in Saigon. Fighting would continue over the course of the next two months to oust the invading forces. And a lot of this fighting was brutal. For instance, in the northern part of that map, you see the imperial capital of Hue, H-U-E. There it would be urban guerrilla warfare, constant bombardment from these North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces. It was a long, drawn-out fight. Now, in the end, 4,000 Americans, 5,000 South Vietnamese, lost their lives in compared to 
8,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops. 12,000 civilians were also killed and 1 million Vietnamese were made refugees. So if you look at these peer numbers, more Vietnamese were killed than Americans. And this is where we get to this policy of attrition. American military leaders, particularly William Westmoreland, looked at numbers as being key to American victories. So therefore, from William Westmoreland's perspective, because you had 58,000 North Vietnamese and Viet Cong killed compared to just 9,000 South Vietnamese and US soldiers killed, this was a military victory. But while there was victory on the battlefield, there was defeat at home. And we can see this in terms of a poll that was taken in early March of 1968, when the Americans were asked whether they believed Vietnam was, quote, a mistake. 49% said yes, compared to just 41% that said no. And in fact, what you're going to see is Walter Cronkite, who was a leading newscaster during this time. He was welcomed into the homes of millions of Americans and trusted. Here in 1968, Walter Cronkite would come out and say, in fact, that Vietnam was a mistake and that the United States should get out of Vietnam. So if you have someone like Walter Cronkite, who the American people trust, more and more people are going to say, perhaps we should get out. Well, as part of this poll, the people were also asked whether they approved of the president's handling of the war. 26% said they approved of his handling of the war. So clearly, Lyndon Johnson realized that he was no longer going to perhaps win re-election in 1968. So therefore, at the end of March 1968, he would go on to national television and he would explain that he was going to begin a bombing halt. He was going to end temporarily the bombing of Vietnam. But at the end of the speech, surprising the nation, he said, and this is paraphrasing here, of course, that he would not seek nor would he accept the nomination for his party for the presidency of the United States. So indeed, perhaps one of the biggest casualties of this war politically was Lyndon Johnson, who now was no longer running for president again in 1968 because of the quagmire that was the Vietnam War. Realizing that the American public would no longer support America's continued presence in Vietnam, we would see the candidates in 1968 sort of offer a way out. But here's the only thing. When the battle went down to the end in November of 1968, it pitted two individuals against one another. Lyndon Johnson was no longer running, so in his place would be his vice president, Hubert Humphrey. Now, Hubert Humphrey, until late in October of 1968, he would continue to support Lyndon Johnson's strategy in Vietnam. And this was very unpopular. And really, until the end of the election, he would hold firm to his support for Lyndon Johnson's policy. Richard Nixon, on the other hand, in 1968, running for the Republican Party, would claim that he had a secret plan to bring about peace in Vietnam. So eventually, by the time the end of the 1968 election takes place, Richard Nixon barely wins over Hubert Humphrey. So now Lyndon Johnson war becomes Nixon's war. Now Nixon, however, promised that he had a secret plan to end this war, to bring peace to Vietnam. But as it would turn out, this war in Vietnam would in fact belong to Nixon as he would carry it out for the next four years. But with one difference, he would do so more from the air than he would from the ground. And this is where we get to this program that you have a document for this week of Vietnamization, because he realized that the American people would no longer support America's continued physical presence in Vietnam, meaning boots on the ground. So therefore, he introduced in November of 1969 this policy of Vietnamization. This policy involved bringing American troops home and turning the fighting over to the Vietnamese. Vietnamization did achieve its goal of drawing down the number of American troops in Vietnam. Therefore, by the spring of 1972, as you can see on the screen, only 74,000 Americans in Vietnam. 
So just like we talked about earlier, when there are more body bags coming home, the American public paid attention. When there are less body bags coming home, the American public paid less attention. So therefore, they were not seeing the new strategy that was being carried out that brought massive destruction to Vietnam, and that was the increasing reliance of Richard Nixon on bombing. What we will see in particular is this take place after the North Vietnamese invade South Vietnam on March 30th, 1972. Because what we will see by this point on March 30th, 1972 is only 6,000 of the remaining 95,000 Americans in Vietnam were actually combat troops. So therefore, what could Nixon do to make sure that the North Vietnamese did not overrun South Vietnam here in March of 1972? He would bomb Vietnam, North Vietnam, back to the Stone Age, particularly focusing on the North Vietnamese capital of Hanoi. This was known as Linebacker One. Well, in May of 1970, or excuse me, in May of 1972, he would continue to carry out this policy of Linebacker One. And during Linebacker One, the United States would start mining Haiphong Harbor in North Vietnam. The remaining U.S. combat troops would eventually leave Vietnam on August 23 of 1972. But here's the thing, the war is still going on, so what is the United States going to do when there are no combat troops left after August of 1972? Well, they had to contend with this because on December 18, 1972, over the course of 11 days, the United States would carry out Operation Linebacker II, a massive bombing campaign. This would include a total of 3,420 B-52 sorties initiated over the course of this Operation Linebacker 2. So in short, Operation Linebacker 1, Operation Linebacker 2, and just general bombing throughout Nixon's presidency between 1969 and 1973 when the war ends, the United States would drop more than 4 million tons of bombs more than double what was dropped during all of World War II. Well, finally, after this last big bombing campaign, Operation Linebacker II in December of 1972, the United States and North Vietnam would agree to peace accords, ending America's war in Vietnam, and this would be at the cost of 58,000 American deaths, more than 58,000 American deaths. So here's the thing, what we will see, this is in January of 1973, by April of 1975, I forgot to put this on the, the, the PowerPoint, but nonetheless, by April of 1975, the North Vietnamese would invade South Vietnam, and in April of 1975, Vietnam would become communist. So yes, the United States was no longer around in Vietnam here in April of 1975, except for some officials in the embassy in Saigon, but this was viewed largely as a defeat of the United States as it tried to contain communism, because clearly in this case, communism was not contained.